Sweet. You okay to hear me now? Sir. Okay. I love hearing my own voice. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just human like that. You know, if I can hear my own voice, I can... Uh... Hey, it's good to see you and thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, my name is Ivan Mawalire and I'm from Zimbabwe. And um, it's just amazing that you folks here have taken um, the people in Zimbabwe as friends and people that you love and people that you care to support. And it always blows my mind away when I meet a group of people who become concerned about other people that they know they may actually never meet or may never get a thank you from, and yet are still interested or at least are still committed to helping and making sure that people who live in vulnerable circumstances and situations have some opportunity to experience the love of God and to also live a life uh, of dignity. And so all the way from Zimbabwe, I want to deliver a heartfelt thank you from the many thousands of children that Naka Foundation looks after and serves in the many different forms. Um, and just to let you know that your help does not go in vain and that if you never hear from anyone in Zimbabwe, I trust and believe that the Lord will always uh, say to you at uh, uh, many points in your life, well done, good and faithful servant, uh, for uh, the work that you have uh, you have done. My job this morning is very simple: is to tell a story, and I, I love telling stories. But particularly, this story is my own life story that I will share with you this morning. And so, uh, for the next three hours, I'm just going to. Uh, <laughs> see how folks respond to that. <laughs> if you laugh, I know that, you know, you're not ready for it. <laughs> if you keep a straight face and pretend like it's normal, I will go for three hours. <laughs> but uh, we, in Zimbabwe, I, uh, I've been in the U.S. now for almost a year and a half, now maybe about a year and a half. And uh, the last five years for me are uh, a part of a life that you could never have paid me to believe would happen in my life, much less in Balkan. And sitting here listening to the story of Jonah, I kind of thought to myself, that sounds like somebody I know. Mm -hmm. And we pastored a church in Zimbabwe with, uh, with my wife and some friends, small church, about 90 people, and we, we thank God for the work that he had called us to do. But Zimbabwe was going through a lot of challenges and still is going through a lot of challenges. I'll give you an example of some of the challenges our country had gone through. In 2008, Zimbabwe experienced an economic collapse of epic proportions. We ended up with the biggest note after inflation had run at about 15,000%. We ended up with a, 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 a banknote uh, a $100 trillion banknote. That was our largest note. One note that said $100 trillion on it. They actually printed a note that said $100 trillion. Wow. And at the height of inflation, that note was not enough to buy a loaf of bread or to get a haircut. In fact, on many occasions, as you stood in the line to buy bread, by the time you got to the front of the line to get your loaf of bread, the money you held in your hand was no longer enough to buy the bread. Yeah. Many children went without hungry. I'll never forget my dad. He's late now, passed away a year ago. Wonderful man of God. Taught me a lot. Some of it didn't sink in until it, until until uh, the school of hard knocks brought it in. <laughs> but my dad had saved about eighty thousand dollars when he had retired in Zimbabwe. Eighty thousand U.S. dollars is a lot of money. But during that inflation, um, he went to bed on one night with eighty thousand dollars in his account and woke up the next morning with twenty-five cents. That's how bad it got. And imagine people who had nothing. Imagine the orphans. And Zimbabwe, uh, up to today, we have, a, for our population of 14 million people, we have about a 10% orphan rate. In other words, 1.4 million children in Zimbabwe are orphans. 
often either through poverty where both parents have died or through the HIV and AIDS pandemic that ripped through Zimbabwe in the 90s and into the 2000s. And all of this is a result of the mismanagement of our country by the government. And so here we are sitting in 2008, this country has collapsed and we can't feed ourselves anymore and people are dying literally of hunger. You would enter a household where a family had not eaten for days and they are waiting to die. In 2016 I sat in my small office, my small church office and our nation was going through another cycle. It had been eight years where we had tried to recover but here we were facing collapse. This time I was a dad. I was no longer just a young man. I had my own children. I had two little girls, five and three, and had a third one on the way. And I was faced with the choice of either facing it or leaving the country. Or there was a third option, which I never thought I would ever do, like I said. But I sat in my small office and I was really, really upset about what was happening to Zimbabwe. Some friends of mine and I would spend time in prayer for our nation, asking God what he would either have us do or asking that he would do something about it. And sometimes when we pray and we ask God to change a situation, we never think that sometimes God could actually involve us in answering the very prayer that we are making. Wow. But we prayed about this for many days, for many weeks, many months, <coughs> and, and we just felt that was the best that we could do. But on this particular day, it was in April of 2016, I'll never forget that day, and you'll discover why I will never forget that day. But I sat in my small office wondering what to do, and so I propped up my phone against my Bible and put it on video mode. I took the flag of our nation, Zimbabwe, and I held my Bible. And I began to speak into this camera, began to talk about how our nation was in need of help that we were at the end of our road, but if we were honorable people, particularly those of us that believed in God, if we were people that had any concern for the future of our country, if we were people that were compassionate in any way, shape, or form, we would say something about what was happening. Now, this is not an easy thing because Zimbabwe for about 37 years had been ruled by a brutal dictator. When he took over the country in 1980, around about 1982, 1983, he gave orders for the murder of almost 25,000 people in the south of the country, whom he felt were a threat to his power. And so Zimbabwe was steeped, and still is steeped, in a culture of fear. You don't speak against the authority of the government. And so this was a big ask, to ask people to say something, to stand up, to at least put up your hand and say what's happening in this country is not right. I didn't think this video would go anywhere. I don't know why I thought that, but I just thought I was too small to be heard by anyone. I didn't think anybody would listen or would at least watch it. I didn't think the video would go anywhere. In fact, it was nothing but just a rant. I was just frustrated. I thought about my kids. I thought about my granddad who had lost everything after fighting the war for independence and being given an empty promise of a country that was going to be prosperous and lost everything. I thought about my dad whose dreams were also stolen as a young man because the people that ruled the country continued to plunder Zimbabwe. And then I thought about my own life. I was 39 at the time, I'm 44 today, and had nothing to show for it. And here I am looking at my children and soon it was going to be their turn for their future to be ravaged. And so I sat there and I thought, at least I've said something. And maybe a few people will hear it. I'll never forget the next day I was taking my children to school and after doing the school run, a friend of mine gave me a phone call and said, Ivan, have you gone to your Facebook page this morning? And I said, no, I haven't, because that's where I posted the video. And I said, why? And he says, you need to go there. Whatever you're doing right now, drop it and, and have a look at what's going on on that Facebook page. Well, I used to have a followership, a great big followership of about 45 people. <laughs> okay, fine, I lie. It was about 35 people. I like to kind of inflate it a little bit. The next day, this little video I had put up had gone from maybe five views at the time that I put it up in the evening to almost 250,000 views. 
I didn't understand what was happening. My heart started to race because suddenly I was afraid. I thought, wait, 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 wait. I, I said what I said, but 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 what you know I didn't mean what people are saying in the comment section because people were now talking about this is the man that we've been waiting for. This is the man that's going to help us put together a revolution and begin. And I said, revolution, those are not the words that I used in my video. You shouldn't be saying things like this. And I thought the best thing for me to do to stop this from spreading is to, is to find a way to correct what I said so people don't get the wrong idea. So to, to remedy that, I propped up my phone against my Bible and recorded another video to try and explain myself. Somewhere in the middle of explaining myself, I got a little bit angry and went right back into talking about, however, there, there are things wrong with this country that we need to fix. That video went viral and almost a million people watched that video and more and more people began to talk about, this is the moment that we must rise up. This is the moment we must stand up. And I thought this is going completely the wrong direction. I am going to get abducted at some point if I keep doing this. So I need to fix this and stop this from going on. So the best way for me to fix this was to prop my phone up against my mind and record a third video. Somehow I didn't understand that if I keep recording videos, this thing is actually growing even more and more. And it was outstanding what took place. In the interest of time, I'm going to compress all of that and just say to you that by the end of about maybe a month or so of doing more and more videos. By the way, I ended up, I think, by the end of the year with about 200 recorded videos that we had done just trying my best to back paddle. And every time we did it, it just kept growing. But we ended up with what people were calling a citizen's movement. I didn't know what to do with it. I was not prepared for this. This is not what we had set out to do. I was a pastor for a small church and not the leader of a movement that at this point almost maybe had four or five million people that called themselves supporters and those that were identifying with this young pastor whom they felt God had sent on a mission to go and confront the powers that be. People called me all sorts of things. They said, this is the most, this, you are going to confront Pharaoh. I said, I'm not confronting Pharaoh. That's not what I'm going to be doing. But we, we, we began to sense one of, one of the elders in our church, his name is Keith, we began to feel that maybe the Lord had placed on our lap an opportunity for our nation to at least have a voice. And I want to read a scripture to you that we based our prayers on, a scripture that, that really began to drive our hearts. And it's in Proverbs chapter 30, 31, verse number 8 and 9, and it says, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. And when we looked at the life of Jesus, we felt that this is something that he would have done. That he would have been compassionate about those who were suffering in a time and in an era. And he would have condemned the injustice. He would have encouraged the downtrodden. He would have encouraged those whose spirits were low to let them know that they can stand up, that they can, that, 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 that God is with them. I love the song that we sang, uh, sang here this morning that spoke about God, the, the God who goes before me, the God who stands behind me. The long and short of the story is that as we continued to speak up, the, the government was not really listening to what we were saying. And so at some point as they began to continue to plunder the economy and, and just steal, literally, the amount of corruption in Zimbabwe was and still is shocking. In fact, has gotten worse now. The money that is stolen from just the public funds. At one point, the government announced that $15 billion worth of diamond revenue had gone missing from the treasury and not a single person, not a single person was held accountable. This is a country with a four billion dollar economy and 15 billion dollars goes missing. This is a country where our health system has failed to the point where babies, babies die in hospitals when, when they are born. There is a night that this happened about a year ago where out of 10 babies that were born in the major hospital in Zimbabwe, out of 10 babies that were born in one night, seven of them died. And there's a horrible picture that came out of these seven babies. They were wrapped up in cloths. You would have thought the way they were stacked, it's, it's, it, it just looked like, like routine and they were just stacked up against the wall. 
Those are lives. And some people just didn't care. And so in that year, we decided that we would put together the first protest. And we didn't know how many people would listen, how many people would show up for the protest that, that we were going to put together. In Zimbabwe, it is illegal for you to protest on the street. You were not allowed to protest unless you get permission from the government. And that's just stupid because that's not a protest anymore, is it, if you get permission? And so we decided that what we would do is that our protest was not going to be a street protest because we didn't want people to get hurt. And that what we were building as a movement was a nonviolent movement that really was seeking justice, that really was seeking truth and transparency, and really was looking for a, a nation that was run better on good morals, where there was compassion for those who have nothing, those who are weak, those who are struggling, a nation that looked after its people, a nation that honored God, Zimbabwe, we talk about the fact that we are an 80% Christian nation. So where is our honor, we asked. And so we put together this protest, and it was a reverse protest. Instead of going on the street, we asked people to stay at home. We asked people to not go to, take, uh, to, not go, go to work, not open their businesses, not take their children to school, and to shut the whole thing down. We didn't know how many people would respond to this. It was just something we thought we must do something as a way of saying to the dictator enough is enough and if we failed at least we had sued for something if we failed at least we had trusted god whom we felt had given us a voice and if we failed we knew that at least god would god would would in some way shape or form raise somebody else or at least that would be a testimony that people that believed in God stood up and said, if we, if, 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 if the God we believe in, if the Bible we believe in, if Jesus whom we believe in is anything to go by, then we will stand up. At least that would be in history. Well, when we called this protest, it was 48 hours to go, and we just had two days to call it, and we didn't know how many people would listen. On the 16th of June, of July, sorry, 2016, the first miracle happened. And I talk about a series of miracles in this journey. The first miracle happened, and it was we woke up. In fact, by the time that this, we were getting closer to the protest, we had to go and stay in a safe house because it was no longer safe for us to continue to be in our homes as people began to take this protest seriously, and the government began to take it seriously as a security threat. The day came and we went outside just to have a look to see what was happening and people began to post pictures and videos from across the country and we discovered that over 14 million people had participated and had heeded the call and the entire country came to a complete standstill. I could not believe it. I literally could. I felt, I often tell people, I felt like going to knock on people's doors and say, are you crazy? <laughs> Why would you listen to a random pastor who says to you, do not go to work, don't take your children, you've got to take your kids to school. <laughs> but this became a moment that suddenly turned things into a very serious situation. Within a couple of days, the government was looking for us, myself and a few friends who had who had started this movement. One of those friends is my good friend, Patrick, who of course founded NACA Foundation that you have supported so well. And we tried our best to make sure that the work that Patrick had started would not be, in a sense, for lack of a better word, contaminated by the work we were doing because this was a little bit more confrontational. NACA was actually helping people on the ground and we wanted to make sure that that carried on. But here we were now, the government looking for us, and within a matter of days, eventually I was arrested, and I was charged. I'd never been arrested for anything. Parking tickets, probably the worst, and I paid my parking ticket. The, the day I was arrested, I was charged with, get this, attempting to overthrow a constitutionally elected government. That's a big charge. And suddenly I'm sitting there and I'm being charged literally with treason and I'm facing a 20 year jail term without the option of release. It was unbelievable to me that this journey that had started with one video had now gotten me to a place where I'm sitting in a jail cell and I'm facing 20 years in prison. We didn't know what was going to happen. 
But the second miracle took place the day that I was supposed to appear in court for my first bail hearing, where they would determine whether I would go home or I would be tried from, from jail. And as I sat in the police cell and got ready to go, the police came and they put their handcuffs and leg irons on me, and they began to drag me off to the truck that would take me to the courts. And as I shuffled along, one of the police officers came and said, we're going to have to wait a minute. There's about a hundred people that have gathered at the courts. They have Zimbabwe flags, they're holding their Bibles, and they're praying and singing. We want to see how we can manage that crowd before we bring him in. So we have to wait. So we waited an hour. And about an hour, the same man came back and said, hey, that crowd has just grown slightly from a hundred people to about 500. We're going to call in the riot police to try and just move them away because we don't want any incidences taking place. So we waited another hour. Well, this guy came back a third time and said, listen, that crowd has just grown from about 500 people to about 2,000 people. And we're not sure what's taking place anymore. Pastor, I think your people are beginning to, to get up together. And I said, wait, 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 wait a second, my people? First of all, there's 90 people that are part of our church. On a good day, there's 90 people. All right? There's probably less than that. Because, you know, and this is where you start admitting as a pastor, we probably haven't been doing a good job of evangelizing. I don't think we even have 90. I think 90 is what we like to say to appear like we're a big church, but we're about 40, about 30, actually. <laughs> So we wait another hour, the guy comes back and he says, listen, this is, I don't know what's happening, but this crowd has gone from 2,000 people, there's about 6,000 people that have wow. gathered, we don't know what's happening. By the, by the time I was ready to go to court, which was pretty much, much later in the day, there was well over 10,000 people that had gathered at the courts praying and singing and they brought candles with them. I didn't know what was happening. Eventually, they actually sneaked me into the court in a small car with dark windows and drove me in just to make sure that people wouldn't try to snatch me. And to be honest, I felt safer with the police than with the crowd. I also felt like, no, please let, don't let them snatch me from here because I don't know where this can lead. But we sat in that courtroom eventually. One of the moments that took place, and I... I don't understand how this happened. I went there with one man who was my lawyer who was helping to represent my case. And as I sat in the dock, a miracle took place. The magistrate asked, who represents this man? Uh, if you can present your credentials. And my lawyer stood up to do it. But as he did so, another 100 lawyers stood up. I, I, can't, I can't tell you how overwhelmed I was. I sat in that dog, I was scared. But this happened, I'm thinking, what's going, where are these people coming from? And these people stood up and they all lifted up their cards. It was an incredible moment. To see people that were scared speak truth to power. Never mind the 10,000 outside who were still singing as this court was in session. Eventually the magistrate determined that this was a security risk and it was better for me to be tried from home instead of in, uh, whilst I was in prison, and they let me go home. In fact, what they said was that they would make a decision the next day. We got news that day that they would re-arrest me that night or the following morning. So once I got home with my wife, who was about eight months pregnant at the time, and here's a tip, if your wife is about eight months pregnant, don't try and start a revolution at that time. <laughs> because she looked at me, literally, I'll I, I never forget this, she looked at me and she said to me, let me tell you something. If you want to die, I can do that. I can take care of that for you. You do not put yourself in danger and put this whole family in danger. I will take you out as pregnant as I am. But that night when we got the news, she said to me, you need to, you need to get to safety. She packed me my small backpack, gave me my passport, she said, you need to get out of here. I had two friends of mine that came and drove to the house that night. Uh, well, they became friends later. I didn't know them from a bar of soap the day that they drove in. And they said, listen, we've been sent by a group of friends who care about you to get you to safety. They drove me across the country for about six hours to a small border where I was able to escape, dramatic escape through that border post uh, into safety. It's a story I like to share over lunch. Usually, you know, I don't, I, I leave that one for you. If you want to hear about it, 
it's it's uh, you know we can do it on lunch over lunch or over coffee and lunch is on you. <laughs> That's how I get free lunches to, to tell that 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 escape. But I got into safety, and the problem was that whilst I was safe, my family was still in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. And the problem with the dictatorship is that if they can't get to you, yeah. then they get to those that mean the most to you. And so now the operation began to get two little infants and a pregnant woman out of Zimbabwe. And it was tough. Eventually, a whole network of people, churches and friends, were able to make the extraction. <laughs> and we were reunited. We thought we would be away for a couple of weeks, but it turned out that the president was really angry. I'm running out of time, I only have four minutes, so I'm gonna wrap this up very quickly. <laughs> and that's evangelicals who will say that about seven times. We have about seven closings. <laughs> His closings are about you know, 30 minutes apart. They're like attractions. We just we kinda keep we keep you hanging. But here we were in this country next door to Zimbabwe, not knowing when we would go back home. Suddenly the president stands up and gives a speech, and in his speech he says, people like Ivan Mawarire, who are pastors, who should only focus on church, decide to encroach into politics. And I want to let him know and any other pastor that we have special jail cells that are reserved for people like you. At that point we knew that we were not able to come back to Zimbabwe, so we packed up the little that we had. We hadn't packed up our home at all and left South Africa where we were at the time and we headed for the United States which is where we came. My daughter was born about a month after we arrived. She's a feisty little girl, she's an amazing little girl and after holding her for about a month and a half and this is a really difficult moment in this journey. I looked my wife in the eye and said to her, you won't believe this but I, I feel like the Lord is saying I must go back to Zimbabwe. It had been six months after we'd left. And she looked at me and said, if that's how you feel, and if it is the Lord, then I think you must pack your bags and go home. Mm -hmm. So on the 1st of February 2017, I left the United States and went back to Zimbabwe. Immediately on arrival, before my passport could be stamped, I was immediately surrounded by members of the Central Intelligence Organization in Zimbabwe. And I was arrested and taken away. This time there were no crowds, this time there was no singing. And I was thrown into Chikurubi Maximum Security Prison where I spent many weeks in solitary confinement. 